Okay. I can see our numbers ticking up a little bit. It always takes a few seconds for the panelists, or excuse me, the attendees to come in to the Zoom room. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being a part of the 2020 Virtual TRE Marketplace. Everything is online. This is day five of six. I can't believe we're keeping the energy up, guys. Thank you so much for being with us this whole time. It's been amazing. I am so excited for this keynote. We've been planning this one for, um, well, I guess six weeks, but it feels like a lot longer because it is definitely pertinent. It is definitely newsworthy. And I'm, I'm hopeful that you guys are ready to feel a little bit uncomfortable uh, during the next hour, but I think it's gonna be really helpful for every single one of us. Um, before we kick it over to our keynote speaker though, I do want to introduce Steph Tung from Uber Eats. She is the Uber Eats business standards person, which is awesome. I don't really know what that is, but hopefully she'll explain that in just a moment. She's like a really cool chick and I, I'm super excited that Uber Eats is here to want to sponsor this keynote presentation. Uber, as you know, delivers food all over the globe and they are definitely a partner that we've been looking at closely here at the Texas Restaurant Association. So I'm really happy to turn it over to Steph. But before we do that, if you have any questions during the session, and I recommend you ask a lot of questions because James is only with us for an hour. Use the Q&A window down below and the chat window down below as well to express what you're thinking or what you're reacting to and definitely ask them questions. So Steph from Uber, take it away. Thanks, Anna. Speaking of uncomfortable, Dr. Pogue was asking me whether I wanted to do a dance and I thought I will let him do the magic of making folks uncomfortable rather than you all watch me try. So as Anna mentioned, my name is Steph and I lead the business standards team within Uber Eats, which if you're wondering what that means, it means we look at the best ways to actually support our customers, eaters, restaurants, and delivery folks when they run into difficulties on our platform. And as Anna just mentioned, we are a marketplace that connects over 500,000 restaurants globally with delivery people to get their food to millions of hungry customers. When TRA made the decision to make this a virtual marketplace amidst the pandemic to reach a broader group of restaurant leaders and suppliers, we were really keen to provide our support and honored to be able to sponsor Dr. James Pogue's keynote today on overcoming unconscious bias. Now, Uber might not strike many immediately as the company to speak up about diversity and inclusion or sponsor keynotes on the matter. And I'll admit it didn't for me when I first joined as we were just starting our journey. But in the years since, I've seen how we've reflected as a company and enacted broad changes to drive improvements in this space, both internally and on our platform. And I've also been able to be part of this in my own work on diversity and inclusion within EATS. But in these past few months, as we've seen far too many in this country face immense hardships, especially within the food service industry, or had their lives cut short prematurely by the pandemic, racism, and systemic inequality, factors that are inextricably linked, we've realized that there's a lot more for us to say and do. As our CEO Dara Khazroshahi said last month, our goal is to ensure everyone can move freely and safely, whether physically, economically, or socially. And towards this end, we've committed to ridding our platform of racism, fighting it with technology, sustaining equity and belonging for all, and driving equity in the community with an emphasis on supporting black owned businesses, especially restaurants. And it's against this backdrop that Dr. Pogue's thought leadership is more critical than ever with his work to directly and significantly address race, diversity, inclusion, and bias leaving leaders feeling the right kind of uncomfortable to drive lasting change and impact. He's the creator of the No Nonsense Experience, a four-part series of discussions on race, diversity, inclusion, and bias designed to move leaders and teams to deep and impactful change. His military service, research, and work as a change agent have equipped him with tangible examples how to foster the right balance between leaders and followers on teams. He provides leaders with highly engaged training to improve organizational behavior and the bottom line. And not only does he do all of this, and I just learned he also has his own podcast, in his leisure time, he occasionally competes as a martial artist where he has five national titles, in addition to silver and bronze medals at the World Championships. Dr. Pogue has two daughters and six granddaughters. And with that, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Pogue. Hello, everyone. I am excited to be, he be here. I am in Dallas, Texas. 
Um, in my new home, I, I've been here now, uh, I think, four years, and I use the term y'all regularly, so I'm all in. Apparently, as a Texan, I've, I've passed most of the uh, rules and regulations, and I got the note that says I'm required to say uh, the great state of Texas, so I, I think I might be all in here. So I want to thank you all from jo for joining for where, from wherever you might be from, and I'm excited to be able to share with you some of the uh, lessons I've learned over time and uh, exposed to you some ideas around uh, not just unconscious bias, but even beyond that, some of the things that we need to unpack ourselves so that we can uh, push to not only um, uh, be the right kind of uncomfortable, but use that discomfort in our leadership to engage and develop and grow in meaningful ways and push ourselves and our, our teams and our organizations to be uh, stronger, greater, deeper, more impactful than we have in the past. With that being said, I want to just go ahead and pull out the share screen function here, one of uh, the fancy things that Zoom allows us to do, and share with you all uh, a series of slides that I think might be uh, useful in helping to add color to the conversation that we're going to have. So let's start with uh, today's plan for the day. Um, I'm going to introduce to you something called uh, DIBS assessment, diversity, inclusion and bias assessment. It's an assessment model that I came up with about three years ago with continual tweaks, as you can imagine, uh, to answer a question that leaders like yourselves continue to ask me over and over again. James, how do we know how well we are doing? How do we know we have grown or are making a difference? So I had good answers at the time, but I needed great answers. And so I developed this assessment tool to, that allows individuals, teams, uh, departments, uh, units, or entire organizations to get a score that says, this is where we are on our diversity journey. This is where we have come to. And then you execute on whatever tasks uh, that are in front of you, whatever programs you want to implement, whatever policy shifts and changes you want to engage with. And then you go back and you check again, take another snapshot and see where you are. So I want to introduce that model to you. Secondly, I want to talk about the DIBS uh, Big A. These are the areas of diversity that I believe have the most impact, and I want to share them with you, uh, see uh, what your thinking is around them, see what the push and pull in your space has been uh, in, that, in that area. And lastly, if we are going to make a difference, how can we do that in meaningful ways when some of us are dealing with some challenging components within our organizations, surrounding our organizations and buildings in the cities and towns that we are, 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 are situated, such that our words may not have the value that we would want our hearts to have them have. So how can we then engage in this, in this serious change and conversation with the partners that we have? So I want to talk a little bit about that as well. So let's move forward. So in terms of understanding unconscious and conscious bias, we have to start from the inside out. And I have un in parentheses because the reality is some of these biases, quite frankly, are conscious biases. We cannot let ourselves off the hook. Sometimes I just think a certain way about uh, people, individuals, situations, cultures, et cetera. And it's something I have to work on. It's something I have to put the effort into. Sometimes we can say, well, everybody has unconscious bias. Sure, that is 100% true but also we have conscious bias. And for some of us, we have to remember that the person in the mirror, that honest critic, is the one that knows whether or not that bias was conscious or unconscious, or if once it was revealed to us as an unconscious bias, that it, we recognize that it had existed for a very long time as a conscious bias, and now it's just been um, um, brought, to the, brought to the light in a different way. So. I believe that working on all of these efforts begins from the inside out. You wanna change an organization? Change the guts and bones and bone marrow of its leaders and leadership. It makes it so much easier to execute on the tasks that you need to execute on when you know and feel and believe the grit of you knows it is the right direction to go. Many of us are in the positions that we are in now because we saw something that others did not. We believed in something that others did not. We could see things other things couldn't, people couldn't see, hear things they couldn't hear. We had a vision that other people couldn't see. The inside of you was different, perhaps, than others. If we can change our insides, we can make a great deal of change in a very short period of time. 
the diversity, inclusion, and bias assessment model. I talked to you a little bit about in the opening about what this um, model was about and what its utility is. So let's just start with some um, uh, broad overviews of what, uh, what we've got going on here in front of you. It's an identity development model, meaning that it is who you are over time. That we shift and move through an identity development model over time. Right, so we might start anywhere and we can go one direction or the other. You can go both directions in this. It's not age connected, it's not experience connected. It is a stage development model that we can move through. So on the hesitant side, if we're in the hesitant space, we'll talk about what that might mean. If we're in the discomfort space, we'll talk about what that might mean all the way through. Let me level set us here and say, where you are is fine. If you're in the hesitant space, great. If you're in the engaging space, great. If you're in the investigating space, great. It doesn't matter where you are. It matters that you don't stay stagnant wherever you might be. Then moving forward is moving forward, right? So we are where we are and that's okay. Staying where we are is not okay. Let's talk about the zero to, zero to two hesitant space. Now, this, if you happen to be in this space, you might say, you know, I prefer to work and interact with people who are like me, whatever like me is. When I'm looking to hire people, I want people that are in, uh, the same kind of person that I am. And when these non-business conversations about race happen, I simply don't think they belong in the office. It's fine for them to happen wherever they might happen, but in the office, no, this is not where they belong. And it's not that I have issues with other people, not at all. We just don't have a lot in common. So I don't choose to interact with them. I don't choose to hire them. And when race conversations happen, I don't believe they belong in the office. Now, discomfort. When it comes to discomfort, I might say, yeah, of course. I, uh, I, I, I navigate around and work with people of different racial backgrounds. It's a challenge. It's hard for me. It's not where I'm the most comfortable. When these non-business conversations about difference happen, I'm uncomfortable. It's, it doesn't make me feel good. And quite frankly, I am not convinced that there's a direct business connection at all. I'm not convinced it's the right thing to do and I'm not convinced there's a business connection. Okay. That's discomfort. Think about where you might be. Five to six, investigating. In this space, yeah, you work with different people all the time and you think it's thought provoking. It's challenging, it's intriguing. These non-business conversations about race, sure, you see them happening. You think they're interesting, but you don't, you don't really see the business connection and you may want to find out what that business connection is, but you don't execute on asking. You don't go there. You don't tap somebody on the shoulder and say, tell me more about that so I can understand it better. You don't say, hey, can we go grab a, a sandwich or a beer or a coffee or a tea? And can you talk to me about your experience? You want to. You think it's probably the right thing to do, but you do not. Therein lies the difference between investigating and experimenting. In experimenting, you work to push yourself to do it. You want those meaningful interactions with people who are not like you. You know that it's not easy. You feel the push and the stress and the anxiety sometimes, but you execute on it. You do tap that person on the shoulder and say, hey, I have a question about what you brought up in the meeting today. Can we unpack that a little bit? When the non-business conversations about race happen, you think they make us better. You think it helps you to engage with your teams in more deep ways. You encourage yourself and push yourself to ask the questions and you execute on that. The difference between investigating and experimenting, broadly speaking, you want to do more and you don't investigating. You want to do more and you do experimenting. Neither one of these are easy and you do feel the pressure in both, but in one case you execute and on the other you do not. Nine to 10, engaging. These are folks that working with people that are different from them, it's just who they are. It's what they are, it's how they engage in the world. They wouldn't have it any other way. In fact, it would be unnatural, uh, inorganic, abnormal for it to happen differently. These non-business conversations are a part of what happens and they expect it and want it and need it to happen. It's who they are. Now, let me pause for a second and just share with you uh, something that is a, a um, Maybe obvious to you, but maybe not. I am a black guy. And as a black guy, I'm also saying that I can be in these situations too. I can be in a situation where I am at zero to two hesitant, where I want to work with people who are like me. 
I want to be around people that are perhaps more black than not, or from environments like maybe I like military people, given my military experience. I want people like me, right? This is not a, a vision on our white pro professionals and colleagues and friends only. Everyone is engaged in this conversation and everybody can find their place in and throughout the model. That being said, if you wouldn't mind, please grab your phone. Grab your phone and if you would, I want you to send me a text message. The phone number you're gonna to use to send this text message is 22333, 22333. The text message you're going to send is James Pogue, P-O-G-U-E, 065. Send a text message, James Pogue, 065, to the phone number, 22333. Once you've done that, you will get a, uh, a note from the Poll Everywhere folks letting you know that you have been entered into the polling, uh, polling area. So if in the chat room, if you could let me know, that you have received a, um, a notification that you are in. If you can let me know that you received the notification that you are in somewhere in the chat, that'd be great. Anybody, anybody? Are you in? Are you in? Let's see. What do we got here? Not yet. Okay. Okay. Nothing yet. Let's see. Just texted it. Let's see what's happening. Let's see what's happening. Let me just do a little back office check really quickly. Boom, boom. Hold on, hold on. Make sure that everything is happening the way that I need it to happen. Let's see. Everybody logged in. Everybody's doing what they need to do. Let's see. Pop, pop, pop. All right. Is anybody in yet now? What about now? What about now? What do we got? What do we got? There we go. Somebody's in. Somebody's in. We're going to give it a few more moments here. Try sending that text one more time if you don't mind. James Pogue 065. See if you're getting in. There we go. I see you, Anna. All right. Appreciate that. Kelsey, Melissa. Excellent. Excellent. Sarah, Ashton, Maritza. Yes. Yes. Okay, Ryan. All right, Lisa. Okay, okay, here we go. Let's move forward, let's move forward. Now, I'm hoping that each of us sees, because uh, I did do a little bit of a shift here, make sure that we all still see my uh, screen. Are we all still seeing my screen? Can I get a thumbs up on that? How about that? You see the screen, we see the screen? Yes, yes, yes. All right, great. So what I'd like you to do is thumbs off of your phones, thumbs away from the phones. I want you to respond to this question. Out of 100% of the race-related information you think you need to know, how much do you actually know? Out of how much of the race-related information you think you need to know, how much do you actually know? Let's see what happens here. Right now, we got 11 to 25 percent. Uh, about over half of us are in that place, in that C space. Others, Let's see where we come down. Remember, put, put those uh, responses into the text message, into the text message that you send me, so we can get your answers using your phones, using your phones. Where do we come down on this? Give you five, four, three, two, one. Thumbs off, thumbs off, thumbs off. All right, so nearly half of us believe that we are somewhere between 11 and 25%, right? While another 36% or so of us think that we know 25% or more, with 15% of us thinking we know 50 to 75%. Now, Six to 10, uh, well, 17% of us think we know 10% or less. Now, I'm going to ask you to uh, pause here and think about these responses. Think about the people that you think might be on the call. 
and think about whether or not you think those numbers are accurate, right? Does this seem to represent what you know the restaurant industry to be? Thumbs off the phone, thumbs off the phone. Let's take a relaxation poll. See where we're at next. Let's see, let's see. Now, different kind of question. It's a bonus question. Let's assume you have tasted both pumpkin and sweet potato pie. Your preference is, there is a wrong answer here. You can get this one wrong. As a former professor, I'm, I'm required uh, to say that, you know, there is no such thing as a wrong answer. That's incorrect. There is a wrong answer and you can give it in this moment. I see already some of us have given the wrong answer. I, I see that some of us have given the wrong answer. Okay. That's all right. That's okay. Jump out there. Wrong answers are okay. Be aggressive with your wrong answer. Let's see what happens. We got 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Look, I'm not going to tell you how to run your life, but as a self-respecting Southerner, sweet potato pie is obviously the only rational answer to this question. And I'm going to need somebody to give me a thumbs up in the chat room just to show me a little love there that sweet potato pie is the, is the clear winner in the pumpkin pie, uh, sweet potato pie uh, uh, ensemble and the competition. Sweet potato pie, it has to be the winner. I, I don't know where some folks are from. I, may, maybe, maybe you're from the Midwest and there's some kind of pumpkin pie phenomenon that I'm not familiar with. Will, I see you talking about pecan pie. It's not on the list. You might be one of those people. Oh, you, Will, you might be that guy in, in the classroom that's all, that gives the additional information. I appreciate that. And uh, pumpkin pie is America. Melissa, Melissa, I'm going to ask you to mute yourself from the chat for the next 35 seconds. I'm going to need you to mute yourself on the chat for the next 35 seconds. Okay, excellent. All right, so let's move forward. Take, take this information back to your friends, Bill Miller's pumpkin pie. I, I, somebody might need to send me a slice of Bill Miller's pie and I'll, 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 I'll give an assessment. I'll report back to, uh, to, to Anna and let you know my thinking. All right, thumbs off, thumbs off, thumbs off. Let's, let's get into the grit and the meat of why we are here. I want you to remember the um, diversity, inclusion, and bias assessment, right? Think about where you thought you might fit. And let's go here. Thumbs off, thumbs off. And please read before you respond. In terms of your board or your senior team, what is their comfort level with diversity, inclusion, and bias? Think about your senior team. Think about your board. Are they hesitant? They just want to bring, be around and bring in people like themselves. Discomfort, where they, they know they have to do these kinds of things, but that's not where they want to be investigating. They're, they, they have the energy, they feel the pressure, but they're not executing. Experimenting, they feel the pressure, they feel it, and they are trying to execute. They're doing what they can do. Engaging. They, it's who they are. It's what they are. They're never going to be another way, and they think everyone should be that way, and they execute on that. Let's give it five, four, three, two, and stop, 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 stop. We're at about one third, a little over one, about one third, a little less in the discomfort place. Investigating at 29%, meaning that 29 plus 32 plus 4%, those are folk, those are organizations, those are senior teams that are not pulling the trigger on the work that needs to get done. About 38, maybe 40% of us are, it's hard work and it's a push and we're doing it or we're doing it because it's natural. Think about the organizations we represent. Think about all the hard work that needs to get done. There's a lot of low hanging fruit that's out there, a lot of difference that can be made right now, but it cannot be done if you do not pull the trigger, no matter how hard it is. We have a lot of work to do to move forward. Now, this is not, you're a terrible person. This is, let's do the work to move through the model, to get to a place, because getting through the model is really a representation of your ability to make moves in the organization. All right, let's thumbs off, thumbs off, and let's take ourselves to the next question. When you think about your team, now I'm defining your team as the people you spend the most time with. 
Rate your team's comfort level with race, diversity, inclusion, and bias. Are they engaging where they think all the time? It's very organic for us to have different ideas and different people. It's important, it's valuable, it's required. It's how we are better, it's why we are better. Are they experimenting? Meaning that it's a push, it's hard to do, but we are going to work to try to execute. We're gonna move policy, move structure, reorganize and do the hard work. Is it investigating where we're feeling the stress, we're feeling the pressure, we know there's a push, but we cannot come all the way around to execute. Is it discomfort where you know that there's something that needs to be done, but these non-business conversations, ah, they don't belong in a workplace. It's not, it's not okay. Is it hesitant? I work and want to be around people like me. I don't want these non-business conversations absolutely don't belong in a work, workplace either. Remember, there's also the connection to the business case. Where does your team fit? Five, four, three, two. And one, what do we see here? What do we see, right? When we look and see that we're still at 30, 40 some odd percent of our teams aren't to a place where we can execute on the task. Again, this does not make them bad people, but it does suggest why they need to be surrounded by a lot of other people to help them think through ideas, concepts, structures, strategies. Right? It's why we need different people in the room. It's not, we're not saying that if you're in the hesitant or discomfort or investigating space that you're a bad person. Neither am I saying that if you're in the experimenting or engaging place, you're a good person. I'm saying it's where you are on the model. I'm saying that you suggest that you understand there's a connection with the business case, that you believe that it's the right thing to do and the business uh, case, good thing to do uh, to engage in diversity, inclusion, and bias and increase your comfort level. Thumbs off, thumbs off, thumbs off. Let's move to the next question. What about you? What about you? When you look in the mirror and you're honest with yourself, what about you? Where do you come down? Do you want to do more? And just Kevin brought yourself to ask for more help, more engagement, when it comes to what's happened over the summer of 2020, have you wanted to read and engage and watch more documentaries, et cetera, but you have not? That puts you maybe in the investigating space, right? Have, it, have you felt the push and pressure to do more and you've begun to do some work, but it's work, it's not natural or organic for you. That puts you in that, uh, in that seven to eight experimentation space. Is this natural and organic for you? It's how the world should be. It's how you are. And you think everybody should be that way. That puts you in that in engaging space. As we look at these numbers, how does that feel? This is who you are. This is who we are. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. If we want to make the big difference that many of us want, that many of our organizations need, that many of the people that we represent require, that many of our guests and clients and partners demand. Again, you're not a bad person if you're in the hesitant space or discomfort space or investigating or experimentation or engaging. And you're not a good person just because of that either. What it means is this is where you are in your diversity journey. You can go backwards or forwards if something happens. That's how it goes. Now, let's talk about the Dibs Big Eight. I mentioned these big eight earlier <clears throat> as the primary components of uh, diversity, it's the big boulders in diversity. It's not to say that there aren't others. It is to say that if one of these items changes in your life, massive things change in your life. If I told you that your sexuality was going to shift to something dramatically different right now, how much of your life would change Socioeconomically, you remember how you were raised, whether you were in a privileged situation or an economically disadvantaged situation. What if I flip that on its head? How might your school district change? How might your opportunities for uh, uh, school change, private or otherwise? Maybe you were in a private school. Now, if you've got no money, you're in public education, perhaps in a zip code where you don't have regular computers. And the school, the, the, the student to teacher ratio is 35 to one. 
If I shifted your gender, how might that change your life? For some of us, religion is how we see the world. It's so critical to us. What if I took that away or you had to shift that? What if you went from being a fully sighted and able-bodied person to blind and quadriplegic? How might your life shift? What if you went from being black to white, from Asian to Latinx? How might the world change for you and how might you change for the world? How might you see things differently? Do you think you might've had a better chance at that uh, promotion or less of a chance for that last promotion? If your race were different, if your politics were different, if your age was different. Again, if, you're from the if you were raised in the suburbs of an urban environment or on a farm, that is important. Absolutely, that's a frame of diversity. My, my challenge to you is, is more important, does it, does it create more waves in your life than say your sexuality might have, your religion might have, your gender might, right? The dibs, big eight. I want you to keep this in mind as we continue to unpack what we can do to uh, lessen the impact of conscious and unconscious bias. The more sensitized we get to this individually, again, working from the inside out, the better we can do. Now, let me draw your attention to the upper left-hand corner on race. Underneath race, there's a bunch of heavy things there. How many of us are comfortable dealing with and navigating through the areas of race? How much do you really know about the question of race? How comfortable are you talking about the connection between, say, slave history and systemic racism on a variety of levels? The immigration question is, at its essence, a race question, isn't it? That's not to say that it's only black and brown people that have questions or have data there that needs to be learned or at least understood or respected. Our Asian colleagues and friends, they have a history too. Our white friends have a history too. Whether she be Italian or he be Irish, they have a history too. I have a friend who is from Ireland and she told, she told me three weeks ago, James, why doesn't the US teach all of its history? You're such a young country. In comparison to what happened in, in places in Europe, it's, it's just different. You could teach everything. With a sarcastic nod, she also says, and what is this social studies business? She has kids that are in that age group. I say that to say, Many of us don't know so many things as it relates to the racial history of our organizations and of our cities and our states and our countries. And that weaves its way into our lack of knowledge in terms of being able to lead well and best. There isn't a tick mark of 27 things you gotta know on the Dibs Big Eight in order to be a great leader. It's a continual learning process and that curiosity is critical. Now, I talked a little bit about uh, when you are uh, learning about uh, race and teaching about race or learning about unconscious bias and teaching about unconscious bias, there's a path to doing it better. Some of you are gonna take this information back and share it with your teams and colleagues. That's why the component of teaching is there. There are three things that I want you to consider as you talk about, think about, learn more about, and teach more about race, diversity, inclusion, and bias. And that is authenticity, empathy, and rationality. These things form a trust triangle. And this is taken in many ways from Francis Fry's good work at Harvard. And I wanna dig into it a little bit here. If we're trying to establish trust, if you are trying to establish trust with your team, with your colleagues, with your peers, with your suppliers, with your vendors, with your partners, it is necessary that you be authentic. It is obvious when you are not. The work that you're doing to not be authentic is obvious to the people that are watching and listening and following you. We humans have a great ability to assess that. She's not being real. She's not being herself. Something's off there. And then they begin to have a, a discomfort in trusting you. There's a speed bump on the path to trusting you when your authenticity is in question, when you are not being you, when you're not paying the most attention to what you have to say, as opposed to what you think others might want to hear or not hear. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's necessary. As a leader, it's your job to create that environment where others too can be authentic. 
where you ask for demand, create an environment where it is appropriate and necessary for them to be their authentic selves. Empathy. Now, some of us, uh, there's a the simpler definition of empathy. They're like, you know, uh, when it's your, it's people believe that you're in it for them. Sure, that, that's part of it. But let me ask you to try to uh, uh, take this path with me to think about what it might be like. If you and I start to think about who, to whom, when, and where we are distracted in that meeting with that person, with those people, my guess is this is going to align pretty directly with the folks and organizations and committees with whom you withhold your empathy. When you see that thing on your screen, whether it be on our Facebook screens or on your video screen when your committee is presenting something, where and when do you get distracted? Who's talking when you are frequently distracted? These are the times and places and persons to whom we withhold our empathy. Your, in, your leadership has to watch and listen for this. See it when it happens to others. Ask them to engage again. And the first person you have to ask is the person in the mirror. Think about the times when you disengage. Here's an example of a, engagement that, or disengagement that can create a discomfort in the empathy uh, leg on our, on our stool. When you grab your phone in the midst of that conversation with somebody, the phone is a beautiful tool. It's well designed to get your attention and keep it. But it's little things like that that can create a distraction between you and the people that need your empathy. There are others. That is one. Rationality. Now, this is the, the quality and rigor and strength of your thinking. So I'm going to encourage you to pay, pay attention to that. Know what you are talking about, but then you've got to be able to communicate it well. Let's drill into that piece for a moment. Now, if you want to com communicate your thinking very well, I suggest you get, work on stories that get to the point and get there quickly. We're all a part of storytelling cultures one way or another. The, a great ways to learn things are through parables of one kind or another. So I suggest that you consider a story that gets to the point but it needs to get to the point. Secondly, and again, I, I, I leverage this from uh, uh, Dr. Fry, especially for our female colleagues, start with your point at the beginning of your first sentence so that you can be certain that when he, pause, pause, when he repeats your idea later on, you've already said it and you can get credit for your idea. As a leader, encourage stories to get to the point and recommend, especially to your female colleagues and friends, they start with their point at the beginning of their argument, the beginning of their point. All right. Now, in review, and this is a great time if you got questions, comments about things to start to dump them into the chat, that'd be great. Um, we talked about the DIBS assessment. You thought a little bit about what your score might be. You thought a little bit about what your team's score might be. I introduced to you the big eight and why and how I think that they are critical and important to the kind of work that we do. And then the trust triangle, how we can use that as a vehicle for engaging significant and meaningful change around the space of unconscious bias. Now, just as a reminder, I wanna go back and just show you again, the results of our, um, our little bit piece of research here. Here's your board uh, responses right? Where we are at 57% plus are in a place where we are not executing on tasks related to diversity, inclusion, and bias because of our comfort level, All right? Then we talked about our teams, where we're still at about 40%, All right? And then we talked about ourselves, where about a third of us are not at the place where we can just be there easily and ask the questions we need to ask, read the things we need to read, and make the decisions and policy and process and programmatic decisions we need to make. Right? With that being said, I'm going to come on back to you and see where we are in terms of any questions or comments that we might have that I can um, 
engage with you. So I, I see a question there that I'm just going to start with around uh, rationality. So I'll, I'll start with that one first, Anna, then I'll, I'll wait for you to uh, give me anything else that we might have. Sounds good. Um, so the rationality and how it contributes to the tr trust triangle, generally speaking, two parts of rationality. One is the quality of your thinking. Do you know what you are talking about? When you come to the meeting, have you, or is your information well-researched, well-documented? Do you have that quality and rigor uh, to your analysis and suggestions, et cetera? That's one part. The second part of your rationality is your ability to communicate this, right? Can I communicate that I, my information is well-researched? Can I communicate that my, uh, uh, my data points are solid? Now, as it relates to diversity, inclusion, and bias, right? I might say that, look, I have had this experience as a leader and I believe that we can do better uh, if we engage different markets around diversity, inclusion, and bias. That means you need to come with a rational, rigorous approach to, your, um, to, the, to the business case around diversity, inclusion, and bias. Then you have to be able to explain it well. And I suggest that you explain it well by A, telling good stories, B, getting to the point quickly. Hopefully that was that that helped you out there, uh, Maritza. James, there's also a, a question here from Crystal, which I think is a good question. I know something that a lot of companies are asking themselves and likely asking you too, uh, which is what is a good start for rolling out a diversity and inclusion policy for small businesses uh, that might be education than it for all staff? Sure. So the first thing I think you need to do is take a step back and see where you are. Whether you utilize an assessment like the one that I provided or another one, or you have someone come in and say, okay, let me take a broad look at where you are and reflect that back to you. It does two things. One, it allows you to have a snapshot of where you are, but additionally, you get the buy-in from your organization that you're taking it seriously, right? Sometimes there, there, there are things that you can do right now. There's some very obvious things you might be able to do. But if you want to get the comprehensive buy-in, whether your business is large or small, you need to get people engaged at a variety of levels. And so that would be, I think, your, your first start towards uh, starting to roll something out, do some version of an assessment. And then from that assessment, it should detail where the education should be pointed and what that education should look like. Should it be something that's individual, uh, individualized and online where everyone can do it at home? Should it be a webinar, like something that we're on now that is uh, ongoing over time? We do a once a month webinar that takes deeper and deeper dives into the unconscious bias space. Should it be a coaching opportunity for people at varying levels? Should it be something that is uh, 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 individual coaching for leaders, which is different than individual or group coaching for the board of the senior management team, right? So it could be a, someone needs to take a look at your HR space and investigate it and see, are you doing the things you need to do there? Are there some soft ways that you have been unkind to people that are different? Right? So there, these are a variety of ways of, of rolling it out, but before you roll it out, you have to see what you need to roll out. You give me a lot of things to write down. Well, you got to have a good pen. You got to work with me now. Work with I'm me. Working. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> okay. One thing that um, came up and I, I see some questions related to this here too is um, I couldn't help but notice that whenever we were assessing, you know, our senior leadership and our board and then our teams and then ourselves that the board seemed less and senior teams seemed less comfortable right, than the teams and ourselves. Is that because the, the self and the teams are not challenging up? And, and how, and I guess it sort of works in like, how do you approach those that might be more uncomfortable in the workplace in a way that's respectful? Yeah, so I never assume that what people are telling me is accurate, right? That's so, <laughs> so I, lying, right, James? Over time, what I have seen is that people are hard on their senior management, maybe appropriately so, but they are, right? So I take that into consideration and they are easier on themselves, which is why I never asked a question about yourselves first. I gotta give you some time to warm up and warm into the fact that I might be flawed, right? We all have challenges. So that's one, that's one reason why I think the scores are different. Secondly, um, the people that are in the leadership positions have been there for a while and are sometimes insulated from what is happening throughout the remainder of the organization, all right? So they may not know. I, I, as difficult as it is for me to, uh, to, to, to feel in my guts and my spirit, I have to recognize that it is possible 
that sometimes the senior management simply doesn't know how or what is happening at the at the uh, at the front line in the front line space. So th that's part of it. And then the next part is that uh, there might not be an understanding to your point of, the, uh, of what the what does the leadership want the team to be thinking all the way through. Is there a pipeline that allows information to travel easily to say, hey, I am the leader. This is what I think you all need to be thinking and believing. And this is what we are going to do. It's our mission or our vision around race, diversity, inclusion, and bias. And the team can say, whoa, Madam CEO, I see what you're saying, but that's not how it's acting. You got five policies here that are not aligned with that. We got to tighten that up. So that policy, that information is not moving freely. Right. And sometimes it's not moving freely because many of us are in that experimentation place where you see it happening, which ah, I don't, I'm not, I need to raise my hand and say something. But I, no, I'm not going to do that. Let me leave that for somebody else. Well, especially in small companies, there may not be anybody else. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Hmm. Um, Steph actually from Uber is actually asking a really good question too um, around where does psychological safety play into the ability to challenge leadership? That's a tough one. The, the, the leadership has to establish for its team, this is, this is an okay conversation to have. Now, who, who doesn't have some kind of uh, very nice and pleasant vision and mission statement that says that all ideas are welcome, open door policy, um, but how does it act in, in, in practice? Sure. If, if, it, if, if people think that they are not safe, if you have a significant number of people saying, then it's not safe. It doesn't matter what you said, it's not safe. So we gotta work on that because you're not gonna get good information from me as a team member if I don't feel like it's safe to open my mouth, right? And that could keep me in the experimentation place, not because I don't want to, but because the environment that has been created isn't safe for me to do so. So how, do you, how does one address that, right? Yeah. Again, I, I think that you have to have, a, there's independent arbitrators that can help with this. You bring in somebody from the outside in, they ask a bunch of questions, they say to the senior staff, look, you know that there's some safety issues here, not physical safety, but psychological and emotional safety. And it's been reinforced by a certain set of behaviors from the senior leadership, both active and passive leadership uh, issues. So I, I think that there has to be a voice that is there because everybody's not in a position where they can raise their hand and, they, and knowing they might get fired, they might get their feelings hurt, they might get yelled at, they might get otherwise um, uh, uh, punished for, for saying, you know what, um, you keep saying that diversity is important, but man, uh, most of the diversity is at the entry level of the company and whenever you have your open forums for dialogue, it's at times they can't attend. Yeah. Yeah, this is tricky. I do agree with you. I think that having someone independent coming in makes a lot of sense. Um, if, if there's some way that pe even small businesses could do that, because you're right, it's so hard to do that from within, especially if you're in even a mid-manager position, that can be really har hard to yes. challenge this way as well as that way. It, it, it does get tricky. Let, um, let, me, I, let, me, let me push yeah. again in another option, because everybody can't uh, afford to have somebody from the outside come in. So they have to lean on places like the Tester Texas Restaurant Association and say to them, we could use your advocacy on this, right? So I, I, I'm certain that you and your team would be open to that email or emails that they receive that say, we're not feeling okay here. Could we lean on you and your voice to help us advocate for change in our organization? Can you help us do this softly? You're good at that. You can tap you somebody. Are. You're right, you're right. I think that it's specifically when it comes to um, unconscious bias, we haven't really been pulled in in that direction, but we have stepped in many times in different restaurants to help help translate basically between absolutely. staff and management. So you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I you know, in so many places, Anna, that there, there is, a, just as a put a, a pin on this, most yeah. organizations have the structures in place sure. to execute and solve all of these problems. What they don't have is the lens, the racial lens in front of them. It will change what they see. And so, as I mentioned in the beginning, if we can change the guts and bones and marrow of people by sh is shifting in that lens, now all of a sudden you see potential solutions. Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely want to get to Kelsey's question because I, I think a lot of us are kind of in this space where how do we move up on the div spectrum? What, what do we actively do to try and 
move that direction. You said that it's great to start where you are, but don't stay where you are. So how do we do that? Well, you know, I, I have a bucket of magical courage. Do you? And <laughs> it, it, it's not easy. So we, what, what we have to do is look ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what, I got it. I'm going to do the one thing or two things or three things today. Yeah. So let me give some really specific granular things. Yeah. Um, there are some organizations that I'm working with now that uh, when we give them homework, that homework is, I'm gonna need you to go out and talk to somebody in your inner circle about a challenge that is happening around diversity, inclusion, and bias. Just go out and tap, tap, tap your cousin, Mark, that you're close to and say, hey, Mark, look, I just wanna run this past you, right? You gotta build up the muscles to do this. Then go and tap somebody in your outer circle. Say, hey, outer circle, Samantha, can, uh, can I talk? It's gonna be, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, Kelsey. I am saying you got to do it, right? It's just like, it's just like going to the gym. You want to get more fit and get stronger. You, if you, if you want to increase your palate with wine, you got to set the glasses up. You got to set the glass, you got to take a sip. That, that is an analogy that this group will definitely understand. Yeah, you see how I shifted? I just, just, right, just, just moved right there from fitness to wine. You got to, you, there's sometimes I think I'm good at my job, man. I tell you. <laughs> I'm glad you do. This has been really good. I mean, you're, you're totally right. I mean, I know that every single one of us likely has been in that situation where we're like, oh, well, you know, Uncle Mark is a little racist and we're just kind of okay with it. We don't challenge it yeah. because we don't want to upset Christmas dinners or, yeah. or that. Um, that is really hard, but you're right. I think, I mean, but let's talk a little bit about this. Like, what are people risking and why is it hard? Can you just outline it? Yes, for so yes. That you're risking? I, again, I start from the inside out. I think the biggest risk is that when you tear down this veil of innocence, you look in the mirror and see that you've been a little bit or a lot of bit racist. And your actions, your behaviors, the structures you've reinforced and put in place, not intentionally, have maligned and hurt and disempowered and disenfranchised many people, some of whom you like and love and respect. That is a tough pill to swallow. To look in the mirror and say, you know, I, I didn't know that I was doing this, but now I know. And you have to be cognizant that we're, we're not talking about 300 years ago. We're talking about 37 days ago. When you made a decision and you didn't see something. And as a result of what you didn't see, all of this that was happening over here still happened. That's hard. That's what, that's what you're risking. When you go and you talk to, to cousin Mark or your colleague Mark, who you think might be a little racist, that conversation with Mark might lead you down a path that, ooh, ooh, I'm not too far from Mark on that one. I might be a little racist too. Now, again, I'm not just talking to my white friends. I'm talking to my pe to people, my people, your people, the people. Second thing that you're risking is some disconnect with people that you are close, in quotations too, professionally close. Otherwise, there might be some misalignment. There's some tough conversations, right? And you may have some hiccups. You may have to reorganize some of your relationships. I think there's an argument for, there's, um, there's, a, there's a blog I'm going to write and perhaps a speech I'm going to give in a week or so that talks about there's racist, there's non-racist, there's anti-racist. It's pretty easy, more or less, to say this is what racist is. It's pretty easy to kind of see this is what anti-racist is. Then there's this middle ground of non-racist. You tell me one activity that's non-racist, unpack at three levels, and tell me that it doesn't facilitate racism. No being way. still, being silent, encourages the oppression of others. So if you have raised your hand and said, you know what, and uh, I, James Polg, am non-racist, unpack it. Unpack it, James. Unpack it and look in the mirror and realize that you might have been that dude whose silence, whose ignorance, willful or otherwise, has encouraged and facilitated racist behavior. Oh, that's not easy. No. But if we, can, if we can grab hold of what is hard, do the things that are hard and challenging and impossible to do, we can, we can do those things that are improbable. Lean towards the impossible makes the improbable possible. I should just write that down. I need to you use that later on. I don't know why you're not recording this for your blog. <laughs> I've already done for you. Um, I, I, I recognize too, James, that like, 
there's not a start and a stop to this, right? There's yes, never yes, a yes. moment, whatever, we're, we're like, all right, we got it. We're racially aware, we're anti-racist, like we're good. Like it's always a, a journey, right? So what are we actually working towards and looking at the business environment, like especially small, medium-sized businesses, if they start tackling this and if they, if it becomes part of their regular conversation, what do they look forward to on the other side of that? Yes. So again, personally, you're going to look forward to being a happier and more engaged, uh, self-fulfilling, self-actualized person. Secondly, same with your teams and your organization. There's, we, we, our, our, our businesses, oftentimes we talk about it being family and being um, a close knit and these kinds of things. If your business only exists to provide profit and product, then, then you can keep doing what you're doing. But if you want to do something different and create an impact in the lives of people and help make people happier and healthier and better, then this is a way to go about doing that. I want to, I want to tie in, uh, someone mentioned, um, how can we engage um, in our communities uh, when some of our community spaces, uh, our community is not aligned with us. Right. You can team up with other CEOs or C-suites and say, this is the direction I want to go. There is an argument for, it will take business leaders to make the changes we would need the world to make, right? You get five, seven, eight, ten 10 CEOs that are um, small business owners and they go and they say, look, we, our, our senior leadership is all white and it's somewhat conservative. I shouldn't say conservative. It's, 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 it's conservative as it relates to diversity, inclusion, and bias. Right. Right. We, we're in that experimentation place. So, but they know and want to do more. That's such a powerful statement. It, we're used to seeing a bunch of black and brown people and young people of all colors raising their hand and saying, I want change. What happens when we get five C-suites who look the way most of our C-suites look that say, I want change too, right? They are the ones that can call the meeting and say, hey, city council, whether I am a Democrat or Republican or independent or Green Party, I'd like to know your plan to uh, make some moves on diversity, inclusion, and bias, uh, city council person, what's your plan? We'll wait. Oh, no plan. Just come back to us when you have a plan. We're business leaders in the community. We need you to have a plan. Yes. I'm just gonna say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I could just go on on that one, but yes, that is absolutely right, James. Um, I, I do. I, I also was wondering, do you have the DIBS assessment on your website for people to access? Or they could go take a look at what, how that's you know, oh, Sarah, I, I will send to you to okay. send to them the, the just just the model just those just, three yeah, just or four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that would be that would be really helpful um, and if y'all use it and don't reference me a pox on you a pox i say <laughs> you are going to be your ears are going to be burning james we're going to be using your name for for quite some time i think um so don't don't worry about that um let's see here okay so over here ah well Steph has, I want to ask one more question before we let everyone go. Sure. Um, okay. I'm starting to read through your question, Steph, but um, exercises for folks where those moments they felt excluded and curious if there's ways to engage on the personal level to bring the conversation in ways that resonate. Yeah. So how, do, what does that look like exactly whenever you want to have those additional conversations with people? Are, are she saying uh, conversations up or just conversations? With it, it looks oh. like. Yeah, go ahead, Steph. Um, this is in reaction to, I think, Crystal's question of how do you, if the community is not necessarily supportive of a small business wanting to push diversity and inclusion. And one of the things I was mentioning was um, when I had heard from the DNI head of Workday talk, she had mentioned starting from a place of exclusion to drive inclusion. And she talked about asking like, Anna, can you remember a time where your voice wasn't heard? And I don't know if that resonates necessarily or is a meaningful approach in this space, but that was just yes. one okay. idea. I was curious to get your thoughts. I, this is where my, my sort of my, my time as a teacher and professor comes into play. I think that you know, people are at different places. And if somebody raises their hand and says, I want to learn more and I want to do more, they shouldn't have their hand slapped because of that. They should be welcomed into the conversation. Secondly, there are sometimes people who are being reluctantly brought in. 
and they have to be treated with kindness and grace as well. Um, so I think that when you, uh, you, can, you can host conversations about difficult topics, set some ground rules, it's gonna be an hour long, it's gonna be two hours long, we're gonna talk about this topic, et cetera, et cetera. To the extent that you can, out that you're not an expert. I don't know much about this, but we're gonna just sort of struggle through it together. Um, and then jump off the cliff together. Now, for organizations that have the, the resources to do so, find, find some professional help. You can really mess up folks by trying to do something that you don't know how to do. You can wound people that are already wounded. You can reinforce biases that are already there. So if you have the, the, the wherewithal, find somebody who can help you engage in this and do so in a meaningful way. If you don't, I strongly suggest you reach out to people anyway and say, hey, do it for free. Because they, they might say yes. If you've got the resources, show people some respect and, and make that happen. But get, get the help you need. And the help you need is not the black person that works in accounting who has some experience as a black person, right? It's not the brown person that, that, that works over in operations. It's not, it's not the woman who's had woman issues and has given birth two or three times to talk you through gender equality, right? You have to be respectful of people's experience. And I'll end with this. There was a time when we utilized um, people's uh, skill sets and experience based upon their skin color and uh, what they brought to the table. We said, because of your skin color, we'd like for you to do this and we'd like for you to do it for free. We did that for a long time. Some might say 400 plus years. We got a word for that. Let's not reinforce, reinvent a different version of workplace slavery where we are going to ask a black guy, brown person or lady to come to us and give us for free what we could compensate somebody else to do, right? So uh, respect people, show them some grace on both sides, right? And so when somebody comes in and says, I don't know, you don't jump all over and say, let's try to have a conversation, but do so in a meaningful way. Set up some good left and right boundaries and then have the courage to start the conversation. It will not be easy. Rarely are things that are good for us easy. That's what we tell our kids. What you learn in kindergarten works for you. Hold hands. Walk across the street. Look both ways. <laughs> James, Dr. Pogue, this, this has been fantastic. I really, really appreciate you doing this for us. I know that it's been very beneficial for everyone in the chat and even people who haven't contributed to the conversation. I hope that it's resonating within your head and your heart a little bit today and take it, take it with you. Um, this is definitely not something that TRA is going to stop talking about. Uh, this is sort of a new platform for us, but we are, we are venturing into that space. We need to be more open talking about that, especially in the restaurant industry in Texas. So again, James, I really thank you. Um, for those of you that are still with us, uh, virtual TRA market place goes on for one and a half more days. We have sessions this afternoon on wellness in, this, in the industry that includes physical and mental. We have a session on immigration operations and how to handle immigrant employees, you know, when you're in the business, which I think is really important. And then also we're doing our session on restaurants and third party delivery tonight, just before we do the awards, awarding restaurants who've gone above and beyond during the pandemic. Um, so definitely tune into that. You can find all of that at tramarketplace.com. Another big thank you to Uber Eats for sponsoring this session. Really appreciate your partnership, guys. And Dr. Pogue, thank you. Thank you so much. I had a great time. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.